Creativity in the Age of COVID with Dr. Judy Bloom and Richard Skipper. It's the only program in which therapy and entertainment come together to show everyone not only how to cope in the age of COVID, but how to be creatively productive through it all. And now, Dr. Judy Bloom and Richard Skipper. Happy Thursday, everyone. Dr. Judy Bloom and Richard Skipper are in the house. We have an incredible <laughs> guest today. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you, Richard? I'm doing great. I do want to let everyone know, but don't be sad. This is the last episode of Creativity in the Age of COVID. But we're going to take the summer off and we're going to come back with a new title, a new show. Well, it's going to be pretty much the same premise, but uh, we've got some exciting plans in the future. Uh, I want to ask you, how are you doing really now that we are able to reemerge and join the human race again? You know, it, it doesn't feel for me all that different, okay? Because I've been I've been working right along. I've been doing you know uh, seeing my patients virtually uh, um, and seeing them virtually since COVID started. <laughs> uh, so it, it's that hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it's nice being a little more free. You know, and more social and more free. And we've had dinner with a couple of people. You know, uh, which has been lovely. And, and just felt normal. It just felt, you know, back to normal life. Um, and, you know, seeing go, going to uh, the Gulf Shore Playhouse last weekend was terrific. And then I'm going to see a concert this weekend. And, you know, so it just, it really, it, it really feels like, you know, not like the old days, but mm -hmm. the new days. So absolutely. I was having dinner with friends the other night. And we were all it was a dreary weekend here in New York. Mm -hmm. But so we took the every, every, everyone was vaccinated. We all went inside and there were eight of us sitting at the table and we all looked around and said how incredible and how liberating it is yes. to be able to do this again. Yes. And my hope and my prayer is that everyone continues uh, to get vaccinated. Uh, continue to follow the protocols also until we are completely uh, out of the woods, so to speak. We don't want to, you know, step backwards on this. Um, and I made my reservation today for my first cabaret show in July. So right. I'm excited about that to get back and see many of my friends and fellow artists uh, on the boards again. Uh, but I want to bring on our first guest today, and I am so excited. When I reached out and Kevin Duda said yes, um, I nearly jumped out of my skin. I'm such a fan of everything that he does. Not only is he a great actor and a great entertainer, but he is also a creative consultant and producer for the Hallmark Channel. Uh, so welcome to the show, Kevin. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Dr. Bloom. Good to see you, too. Yeah, it's great to see you. And 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 every Hallmark show just, you know, touches my heart. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I that's what I hear. I actually personally haven't I don't watch a lot of them, mostly because I think <laughs> it's not because I don't I don't want to or don't love them. It's just I uh, actually don't want to get wrapped up in anyone else's stories, actually. Right. <laughs> I try to I try to maintain a good a good outside point of view on on what they can do, what they can't do. How did you end up at Hallmark? <laughs> well, first, let me back up and say, Richard, how could I not say yes? I am a huge fan of yours. Um, you. I've known uh, I've known of you and and seen you for so many for years. So I I when you whenever you email me, I I my eyes light up. So thank oh, you thank for having me. I'm it's a lot. honored to be here. Um, and um, so <laughs> Hallmark is an interesting story. I'll make it as quick as possible. The kind of the kind of what brought me to them was I was working on a, a musical. Um, my theater is my, you know, used to be my, I used to be my bread and butter, sole bread and butter. That was, that was all that was on the plate. I didn't really do TV or film. Um, I, I landed a, a voiceover job, but as an actor, as a, on a cartoon, but that's kind of the extent of my TV film experience as an actor. But I was, I knew I wanted to produce and I was working on a, a musical by DJ Salisbury and Larry Moore. They had this beautiful Christmas Appalachian musical about growing up in the hills of Louisa, Kentucky, and it was it really it really just pulled at my heartstrings mostly because I had no idea about the Appalachian Mountains, but it was so familiar to me just in the family element. So I thought, well, geez, there's there's such 
there's such universal qualities about these stories. And I knocked on every, every, I want to say almost every regional theater in the country's door to get this sucker produced. And every single artistic director said, we love the piece. We can't take a chance on it because Christmas is when we look at, when we make our money, we do Elf, we do Christmas Carol, we do these big juggernauts. And, and I, I couldn't fight that. I mean, it's true. You know, that's, that's a really huge um, time fiscal for fiscally for, for a lot of these theaters. So I, I, you know, I, I closed that door and then I had a glass of wine <laughs> and then as I do. And then I thought, I thought, well, if they're looking for brands, how can I make this into a brand? How can I make this attractive and have the same kind of, maybe not the same level as elf, of, co of course, but have at least a brand quality to it. And then I, it dawned on me that it was very much uh, a Hallmark ish esque story. So I, I cold called Hallmark. I just picked up the phone and I happened to connect with an, a development exec there. And excuse we, me, uh, it, it was, it's all, I mean, talk about fate. Did you know who you were calling or you just took a big chance? Well, I got a name from a friend. It was like, a, it was like sort of like, I feel like how the, how the mob works a little bit <laughs> because I got a name from a friend and like, the phone number was scribbled on a napkin. I mean, it was you know very very suspect, um, and I didn't really I didn't really preempt the call or anything. I just thought, well, listen, this is either going to work or it's not, and I'm going to find out at when this call is over. So I called, and she at her name was Ashley Squires, and she ended up she and I ended up having so much in common with theater. She had gone to school for stage management. She's FSU grad. She lived in New York City, worked on theater. For, so we just all of a sudden had all of these bubbles that were kind of the same. And it was funny because I, I sort of, I didn't chase her for a year. I didn't like stalk her or anything, but I did kind of, you know, we had the initial call and then we had another call and then we, and then she went into production. So I lost, you know, contact with her for a couple of months. And then I'd call her again and she'd always say the funniest thing. She'd say, oh, it's so great to hear from you. Remind me, how do I know you again? <laughs> She'd always have to remind herself that this wasn't some weirdo, you know, off the streets of, of New York trying to trying to get a job. And through that friendship and that that you know that relation work relationship, we started finding a lot of synchronicity and in, in what we were producing and wanted to develop. It's funny, it turned out that that initial property that I wanted to bring to them was not a fit at all because Hallmark doesn't do musicals. They don't do they they have a uh they have a I don't, I wouldn't say it's a negative thing to do music, but I have found that music, the, the reason is, is because in 84 minutes and 55 seconds, which is a Hallmark movie, mm -hmm. music can take up a lot of time. So, you know, it does, it does take up a lot of the storytelling. So it was impossible to get that done, but we moved on to other properties. It was, she kind of said, what do you think about this? And it, it just totally took off. And that's where my Hallmark career started. Well, what do you think it is about the Hallmark Network that it still resonates so strongly in today's world? I mean, the shows are about love, family, all those things that are important to us. But there are many people uh, in on the other side of the spectrum, you know, the decision makers who normally pass on these types of stories. So, you know, what is the secret to the success of the Hallmark Network beyond the obvious things that all of us here really like. I mean, I think it's I think it's akin to comfort food, right? Like there's there's those there are those things that we always kind of return to at the buffet that just oh I love mac and cheese, you know, and I, I hate to I don't mean to minimize what Hallmark does because I think it's actually it's always there for you. It is a it is um, uh, and as they kind of, you know, grow, grow as a network and, um, they have a new CEO, um, uh, notably a black female CEO. So that's very new for the, for the, you know, for the family of Hallmark, um, not new in their thinking, just new in their, in their visibility, really. You know, I, I, I think they've always been a network that has been looking ahead. I really do. Um, and it's, it's, it's what the timeline can be for that. How, how quickly can they can they uh embrace things how what is that timeline because they're a business you know it is it at the end of the day it is a, it is business um but i think it's 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 they're very in 84 minutes and 55 seconds what i've really realized about hallmark is we can dive into characters more so than than 
situations. Mm -hmm. So if you think of the care, we all have that. We all have such a, a the humanity of all we that humanity that connects all of us. And the, and the, there's really only I, my acting teacher, thank God, told me once that I've always held on to, which is there's really only two emotions: love and hate. So if you boil everything down to that. The storylines are simple because we want everyone in 84 in that time frame to be able to resonate with a character, resonate with what they're going through, and still have time to kind of find the hope and the good feeling about um, where the, where they may not. We always say they may not get they, they may not get married on the last day of the film, but there is possibly the inkling that things are going to go well for them when the when the cameras shut off. Right. Have, did, have they dealt with COVID at all at, in any of the um, Hallmark shows this year? They uh, they have, as far as like COVID, the, the, the actual material, ver like environment of COVID? Yeah, well, yeah, have they incorporated, you know, people, it's a family, you know, it's about families, it's about love, it's about, you know, struggle and, you know, all that. I mean, have they incorporated the COVID storyline? I, you know, I'm, I'm not really sure they have, and I think it's because and I can't, I, you know, I'm definitely not the spokesperson for Hallmark. They, they, they themselves will definitely tell you that. But I will, I will say that because it's, it falls into a little bit of an escapist uh, mm -hmm. network, and the storylines are a little more uh, takes take take our our the 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 kind of everyday away. I'm not mm -hmm. sure that they would want to get into that. And the other thing I will say is that uh, the Hallmark cycle is about a five year cycle, right? You'll see these great movies in year one, and then they'll kind of replay in year two, year three, and they can kind of sort of phase out by year five. I think in year five, if we were all seeing COVID, we'd probably be like, shut it off, shut it off. <laughs> <laughs> we're saying that now. <laughs> exactly. exactly. So you're saying, so it would be too dated for them. It would be a too, you know, I think so. Forward. I can see that. I think so. I don't want to spit. Yeah, I don't want to speak for them. Also, you know, I think, again, it's that it's that kind of we want to see um, we may not. The, I, the other thing I think that what, what Richard was saying is, is true. It's about love. And we don't all ex we, ex we experience love on different levels. Right. Every day. I mean, you you Dr. Judy, you can speak to this more than I can. But from a filmmaking point of view or storytelling point of view, that first love that really meaningful love doesn't happen to us every day. And I think that's sometimes why people tune in is because that mm -hmm. that tends to be the most visceral kind of love and the most kind of like breathtaking moment, you know, of love, so. Now, since we are in uh, Pride Month, uh, I think that for the first time they had a gay storyline this year. They did. Last year, they had uh, two uh, characters. They they had a, a, a two lesbian couples who were uh, who they celebrated their wedding, and I think they're gonna you're gonna see more of that. Um, I don't think, again, not speaking for them, I'm not their press rep, but I will say that from what I know, you know, Wonya uh, Lucas, who was their CEO, basically said the very basic the very basic line, which is, we should be telling stories about the people who are watching the network. It's as simple as that. So I don't think it's um, you know, I don't think it's more gay content or more black characters. I think it's all of that. I think that's all what it should be. It should be whatever, you know, it should be whatever the story demands and requires and whatever viewers are watching, we want them to, you know, they want them to be seen. I will say this. I believe that if every network followed that paradigm, uh, television would be a lot better. Uh, and I say this because, I mean, I look at the Oscars and the Tony Awards, for example, there's a very specific audience that, that those shows are created for. And yet the producers of these shows are trying to get a different audience to come in and watch it. And I would think that their audience would really grow in leaps and bounds if they gave the audience, for example, theater lovers, movie lovers, a celebration of both of those fields. And it would just turn things around. I 100% yeah. agree. Yeah, I, I agree as well. I agree as well. People tend to go too broad a lot of the time. Yeah. Well, I do have to ask you this. Um, whose idea is it for Christmas to be celebrated seven months a year? <laughs> <laughs> I can't answer that question because I, think it, I mean, I, I think it's as simple as it's an extension of what we just talked about with the comfort food, like people in the, in the, in the, in kind of the most um, 
trying times there's something about christmas that we all you know i don't know if it's because we all went to school and christmas vacation was the thing to look forward to mm -hmm. i don't i don't really know i mean i know that um they have um you know they like to celebrate the season they're in so i know that christmas in july was a thing for a while for them i'm not sure if it's going to continue they're constantly kind of ebbing and flowing with what the you know what the viewers tell them they want to see mm -hmm. Well, I want to ask you, I mean, does is there a Hallmark studio where a lot of the production is done or is everything sourced out? Almost everything is sourced out. So it, it's um, it's uh, the way we film is very quick. It's very quick and I would say quick and dirty, but quick and clean. Mm -hmm. um, it is uh, it's 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 because they do upwards of 96 original movies every year and sometimes 40 to 45 of those can be just at christmas i mean it's just mind-blowing i mean i i get goosebumps and the sweats every time i think about that but um they they have uh they have they have it down how we sh how we film movies so to be able to get a studio they're actually, by using the world at large, by using on location, they're able to actually diversify so much more um, of the of the storytelling. Mo all, all three of my films in 2019 were filmed in Canada. Uh, one was filmed in Vancouver uh, and on beautiful um, uh, Vancouver Island. It was absolutely stunning. The 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 views uh, and the director of that Claire Niederperm was so smart. McLean Nelson, the the executive producer was also, I mean, they're just such a smart team. They they said, listen, you know, the whole the whole movie takes place on an island. We can't ever get away with a shot that doesn't show the island. And I thought, wow, that's gonna get really, I thought in my very limited like thinking, that's gonna get really old really fast. And they mm -hmm. were exactly right. I mean, the more of the island, the better, you know? Um, and then I did two in Winnipeg. And Winnipeg is a city that has history, it has, contemporary a lot of contemporary features so you're able to get a lot of cross environments mm -hmm. uh, it's very much like old new york in a way because there's a lot of old architecture and then there's also a lot of new architecture so we film in 16 days sometimes 15 16 days um it's usually a six days on one day off five days on two days off five days on or six days on and then we're done so that that allows us to kind of schedule these these locations ahead of time and mm -hmm. and and commit to them. So it makes production easier. Mm -hmm. How did they adapt during the, during COVID with all that production that they normally do? Yeah. So there's there was there was bubbles created. SAG was very involved in and in how they did it. Mm -hmm. They basically created bubbles. So there was a central bubble where only the actors uh, the actors only uh connected with the people that were the most important so one hair person one makeup person always masked always with the guards on you know and they did covid i know i wasn't on uh, any productions in the last year because most of them had already been by the time i was done in 2019 a lot of them had already been staffed going into 2020 so i would have been looking for end of 2020 into 2021 um but Laura Osnes, who's a friend of mine, was on a one in Connecticut Love and she's lovely. She's fantastic. Um, right yes. And um, she uh, she kind of detailed the, the process and it was super efficient and super safe. And they they quarantined them for two weeks. And this was in the middle of in the middle of COVID. It was really March, April that I think that she shot her April, May. And it's it's astounding how they were able to still achieve a beautiful at nothing you wouldn't have known a thing about it you know amazing. that it was filmed that's amazing yeah. one of the things i wanted to ask you about was um i was reading that a killer party that you that you produced was a a, a digital hit tell me what that means <laughs> what's a digital hit that's a press that's a press term for to to give us marquee <laughs> value no 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 it's we <laughs> No, Kevin, I love no, you. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Killer Party was a whole different, a whole different set of rules. Um, di digital hit. We basically added the word digital because technically it was a musical. It was a really, it was truly a musical. It was written as a musical, but we needed to say some. It wasn't a film. It wasn't. We didn't want to say a cinematic. We didn't want to. We didn't get want to get too fancy because it was filmed on iPhones. For, for Lord's sake, you know, it was it was not like some feature film. So digital felt the best way to actually translate 
folks to the idea that it was it was cinematic in nature, but it was still theatrical in storytelling. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that got across, but we were a, we were a digital hit. <laughs> that is amazing. I want to go back to March of last year uh, when you first started hearing about COVID. Um, what did your calendar look like? What was your schedule like? And how were you able uh, to adjust at that time to these major changes happening in your life? Well, I had just come back. I also produced for Norwegian Cruise Lines. So I had just come back from, cue the dramatic music, Italy. And I was in Italy through February 12th, I believe. So I had just gotten back. Um, it, it reminded me of, I mean, it was, we, we were on a ship and I was in Italy and then Barcelona. It reminded me of kind of, um, I don't know if you remember, it's so funny that it was a ship analogy, but when I was a performer on a ship, um, uh, uh, Blair Witch Project had come out. Yes. And so I didn't get the I didn't get the news. I didn't get papers. And someone said, "Let's go see this Blair Witch Project." And I walked into the movies thinking it was completely real, being scared out of my mind. It <laughs> felt the same walking back into JFK because this whole onslaught of like terror news had come on about this thing that mm-hmm. it, I, I won't say that that it wasn't happening in Italy or wasn't happening in, in Spain in the same way I just wasn't hearing about it because I wasn't you know I'm not I'm not a, I'm not fluent in Italian or fluent in Spanish and I I didn't have I wasn't really on to, to watch the news so it was an onslaught when I came back and and you know that was at the time when people in the theater community especially I was also keeping in touch with Hallmark but it, it was that we were telling ourselves tales of, oh, this will be a month. Oh, it's two months. Oh, it's three months. And I'm sure you've, you've heard from other, you know, from other folks on the on the show is, yeah. if we remember back, I just remember thinking, oh, June 1st. Okay, cool. June 1st, we'll, we'll be done. You know, June, July 1st. And then I, I can't quite put my finger on when we knew that it was going to be, you know, mm-hmm. a longer stint. Um, or certainly this long. My calendar was, uh, I tend to keep a very, you know, short-term calendar. I'm not, I'm, I'm booked out for Hallmarks, you know, sometimes a month in advance, sometimes two months, but really not more than more than that. It's, so I had some production coming up for, for Norwegian Cruise Lines, which was obviously shut down. Uh, we had a workshop put together for a musical I was working on, which was obviously shut, shut down. And, you know, and 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 that's when Killer Party kind of came in and saved the day. Jason Holland and Killer Party. Wow. Well, I want to go back for a moment. You were on the ship. Um, where were you uh, located, by the way? Because Italy was one of the first epicenters that we were first hearing about COVID. Uh, so, where were you? Do you recall the first time you even heard the word COVID, and what you were hearing at that time? We were, I was on a ship in Ancona, Italy, which is on the east, northeast coast. Mm-hmm. It's above, um, above, um, uh, um, oh my gosh, uh, Venice. It's above Venice. So um, we were there, and I was there from December 25th all the way through January 2nd, uh, sorry, February 2nd uh, in installation. I think the first time we really heard it, and, and remember this is, I was on a ship that was being built, literally being built around us. So no no normal internet service, no cell service of any kind. Really, it's it's really the boonies. Um, and, and when you're immersed in that production, you're not really, again, kind of, like I said before, you're not really popping on the news. I think the first time we heard about it was when the ships were about ready to launch, and this was a brand new ship. And that was kind of the first time you heard of the inkling of it all. I mean, Ancona isn't necessarily, you know, Ancona is not a big city. It's a coastal city. It's very much built by the shipyards and the and the, the ports um, from Croatia that come over, the 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 the, the, the ferry boats that come over. Um, it's so it's a, it's a lovely city, but it's a lovely you know larger town. Um, and I and we also had a ship going out in France, and I was in contact with that producer, and they had heard of it quicker than I had. Um, and so people were getting very nervous, starting to get very nervous about, well, we don't know much. Are we, should we even get on the ship? Should we, you know, should we, should we work in this way? And the cruise lines were, were great with us. They were, they were, they, they gave us the choice. They gave our crew the choice. You know, they said, you don't, we, we can, we're going to postpone this. We're very smart. 
um, especially um, the, the folks in entertainment for Norwegian, very smart about, about our safety. Um, and I got off in Barcelona. I stayed there for six days and I flew home and if it was not still set up for the testing site that it, it came to be in February, um, uh, but I went, I went right home. I didn't, I, we, we sort of knew at that point that, you know, better not to, better not to, you know, see anybody at that point. So um, I had limited, I was also exhausted, which helped. So I was just kind of de decompressing after a couple of weeks of production. So, you know. And as everything started to unfold as your schedule, of course, is starting to fall, like everyone's like a house of cards. Uh, when did you, you're I know that you said that you don't plan that far in advance, uh, but when did things start canceling on you? Um, I would say right about, I, I believe Mar the last day of Broadway was March 12th. Is that right? Or March 19th, right. something like that. March 12th. Um, and I had, I had, uh, yeah, I had cruise lines plans with a Royal Caribbean uh, to go out with them to start, to start talking about insulation right about the end of the month everything in the short term kind of just fell apart. So everything that was right up, right about 10, I would say 10 days after March 19th, you know, right at the end, very end of March, um, things, everything kind of went away for April, May and June. And that's when I say like, we all had that hope that, oh, July will be okay. We're not, you know, not, nothing's going to happen in, you know, past July. Mm -hmm. So it, it was kind of, it was kind of, almost i won't say better because the whole thing was a nightmare the whole thing was a disaster but i feel like it might have been better hearing it in those and maybe maybe it was better thinking that that it was going to be short term maybe that's how we all dealt with it maybe in our subconscious we all knew it was going to be longer but we had to think of it in the short term just to be able to to survive and not collapse along with the projects but yeah, everything almost everything in the beginning of the summer through about mid july started to cancel for me right right after broadway shut down and how were you able to, uh, I'm sorry, did you have a question, Judy? Yeah, um, how were you able to uh, keep creative during this time frame? Uh, obviously, I mean, I'm assuming that you've been home uh, for most of this time. So how have you been able to exercise your creative? <laughs> Well, I will say, thankfully, Jason Howland came along with Killer Party. That was being launched out of a cannon like I have never had in my entire life. Jason called me. He The, the quick story of, of Killer Party is he and Laura Osnes had three, I think, three symphony dates um, scheduled. And they started having these dates, you know, these dates in the, in the meantime kind of canceled. And I remember Jason saying, well, I still have three symphony dates and I feel like they're going to happen. So I'm not, you know, we're not too worried. And he and Laura got the call at the same time. And I think they called each other and said, what, what are we going to do? Like what we can't, we, every, like there's, there's not even anything to really work on. Like, what do you do? Like, it's not like, well, I'll work on this in anticipation. You don't even want to put the work in because who knows if it's actually going to happen. So Jason quickly said, I think in jest to Laura, we should, we should do a quarantine musical. Ha ha ha. And then Jason Howland, as he does, the wheels started turning. He started putting quarters in the machine and everything, you know, the monkey started clapping and he started, you know, <laughs> thinking all of it. Um, uh, and he said, you know, what is what makes the most sense if no one can be together and no one can leave the house? And then he said, well, if you if you do a murder mystery, everyone gets sequestered to their rooms for questioning. And that was it. And then all of a sudden he brought on Kate Kerrigan, Nate Tyson, Rachel Axler. He called me. He called Mark Bruni. He, he said, Laura, you're in because you were, we all, you know, first of all, who wouldn't want Laura in it? And second of all, she was right there at the beginning of the conversations. And it, it, it came together quicker than any other project that I've ever worked on. I mean, within two weeks, we had a full cast and we were having a meeting of how everyone was going to shoot the sucker. And it was, you know, does it, what, what kind of iPhones does everyone have? Does everyone have Dropbox? Does everyone, who uses WeTransfer? Is it, who has, can show, give us pictures of your closet. Laura, do you have anything that resembles a clown costume? I mean, it was like the most ridiculous <laughs> questions you've ever had to ask. You know, Tony nominee Laura Osnes in your entire life. I mean, like, I just, you know, shoot me for, for asking her, you know, what size is your nose so I can order you a clown nose? I mean, <laughs> you know, but, but there was this, you know what I love the best thing about Killer Party to me was not the end result, not that it was a digital hit, but the fact that it was, it reminded me of community theater. It reminded me of, the of community theater 
with the most talented people you ever want to go back to community theater with. There was a can-do kind of Mickey, Judy, let's put on a show feel about it that mm -hmm. it just resonated with everyone who was who was in that cast. And and there was no one, no mm -hmm. one said no. Everyone said how, but no one said no, which was nice. You know, I, I do think that, that that's emblematic of what we're going to be seeing in the future is new technology being developed as a result of the changes that we've all gone through. Um, it, so it's, yeah, it, it spurs creativity in that way. You know, I, whoever thought we'd all be living on Zoom, you know, whoever, that, you know, nobody even imagined that. So there'll be right. more virtual reality, perhaps, you know, kinds of productions. And I, I don't think it's going to go back to being the way it was. Mm -hmm. I think it'll be something, a, a whole new hybrid, if you will, of mm -hmm. in-person things and not in-person, but different, you know, and, and just like during, you know, the the plague <laughs> it led to all kinds of innovations it did you know it did. right, I, right. I, I think that's going to happen here too it's just going to you know people ha have been working on stuff and you know figure out how to how to keep life going and keep life interesting and we're going to see more and more of that and Kevin, from where you stand, are you actively involved in setting up the protocols, either on the ships or uh, in the uh, in the film studios, with uh, the way people are dealing with COVID, or is that something that's handled, and you just step up to the plate? So SAG, AFTRA, and the unions have really have really set the bar. Um, I think you know. I think. Um, I mean, I, I don't think it's fair to say they've been late to the game because I don't know if anyone really was, I don't know if anyone really had the, I don't, I don't know if any unions had the preparedness to really know. I mean, I, I forgive the, I forgive a lot of, of mm -hmm. the kind of, um, you know, uh, union, union issues that so many have on social media or interested in life about this whole predicament. I absolutely forgive them for all of it. I, I think it's, it's unfortunate that we've had to learn in real time, but we are. Um, SAG seems to, because of the ability to not have an audience present and not be virtually always reliant on on that live portion that theater mm -hmm. is, it seems to, that, that they've been able to have an easier time transitioning into, well, we can do the same thing, we just need to do it on a, on a more secure level. Where theater, we're just out to, out to lunch, you know, we just, there's just no, there's no theater. Um, and um, and I will say, over the past year, as as much as I loved working on Killer Party, Killer Party was its own thing. I was I got nervous, kind of like everybody, as the you know the young theater, uh, you know um, exuberant theater kid in me. That oh no, what if we lose? What if we lose live perform? Like what is this? You know, I, I don't I don't think it's being dramatic. I think it's just we're always kind of anticipating mm -hmm. something really eclipsing our art form in a way, because there is so much TV, there is so much film. It is able, it is easy, it does make maybe some more money. It, it is more, you know, it's more lucrative in a lot of ways. But I think this year has taught us that people, I've seen more than anything, people say, man, I can't wait to be back in person with that energy. There's something we've all, I think we've all identified that at least there's an energy about theater that will never be replicated on any, on any other level. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting. Our very first show that we did back in September, Scott Westervelt was on the show, who is in charge of wardrobe for all the Hamilton productions. And I actually had dinner with him the other night. And uh, some actors have left the business because of the past year. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, he said uh, the other issue that he's dealing with are body types have changed a lot. <laughs> over the past year so he's busy 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 i want to add and you brought up something kevin that i'm thrilled that you said uh or that i'm happy that you brought up and you know i feel that on social media especially a lot of people have been very very critical of equity and sag in terms of how they're handling everything and they are walking through the same waters that all of us are walking through right now they don't know and they want us to come out unscathed on the other side. What are the similarities and the differences uh, in terms of the protocols that are in place uh, for both Hallmark and for the cruise ships? 
So the cruise ships right now are going to be, you know, they're, they're really, they're, we're in the middle of a big fight between what we're seeing with the Norwegian Cruise Lines president, Frank Del Rio, and the state of Florida. Right. which is really an interesting fight. I mean, it is, it is, it, it's fascinating to watch. I, I can't even imagine that it's actually happening. Like, I feel like I'm watching a drama, you know, or some political, you know, veep or something that's actually playing out. But uh, they are, you know, Cruise Line has been ready to go back. Mm -hmm. the, the interesting thing about Cruise Line is, uh, I, I, think, I think now that we have these, these protocols in place a vaccine and testing they're actually able to to have a ship that is free of covid yeah. right they, I, mean, I think they can I, I mean i can't i can't legally say that but i think that they have the protocols in place to be able to this ship can be a protective place the problem is cruise ships are about visiting ports so now all of a sudden you're you're, you're getting off and getting on getting off and getting on and so that's that is what they're dealing with right now. Is I think they're dealing with the different ports. Um, I think in the meantime you're going to see a lot of safe ports. Like we'll go, we will go to this port and back, or we'll we'll give you. I think we may see a little bit of a return to actual cruising, meaning going out on the ocean and experiencing the ship itself for for five, four out of the seven days, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, but they have no they have no, no discernible um, protocols in place that I know of, other than Norwegian is saying. If you want to cruise, you have to be vaccinated. And if you want to work on the ship, you have to be vaccinated. Um, so it's going to be, you know, I don't know if either of you have worked on ships, and this is not specifically Norwegian, but below deck, it ain't luxury. You know, it's not, know. <laughs> it's not, I mean, you don't sign up for, for staterooms and views if you're going to be a crew member on a, on a cruise ship. You know, sometimes it's four to a room. Sometimes it's four to a room and one bathroom being shared with the other cabin next to you. You know, it's, and those, I think those, are, that's the granular level that they're working around right now. And that's why the vaccine is so important. Um, as far as theater, it's interesting. Equity is, um, is again, like you said, Richard, I can't blame them for anything. And they're being very safe. I think the last thing they want is any any type of lawsuit against the union for saying, go be free, do theater. And all of a sudden these theaters come back and say, you you know, you, you've, you've steered us in the wrong direction. So they have these tent poles right now up. I know my partner when is you working- You talk about below deck, excuse me for interrupting, but if anybody has ever been yes. backstage in a Broadway theater, there's no space there. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> right. Correct. Correct. And these and these old theaters, I mean, you know, you see yeah. you see announcements coming from Jujamson and I think it's the Schubert's. I think I mean the Nederlanders are gonna be soon to follow about the new ventilation system. But you're right, it's like it, the ventilation system helps everyone above deck, right? You go down into the hollows of these of these beautiful historic theaters, and it's not it's 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 not spacious. It's not luxurious. I mean, I was lucky enough. I think probably half the reason I stayed at Beautiful the Carol King show was because it was in the sun time and, <laughs> and we had new bathrooms. Um, but you know, <laughs> um, it was it was just you know a spacious theater. Um, uh, but yeah, you're right. It's 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 tricky. It's tricky on Broadway. The 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 union is you know in January the union came out with these set of guidelines that was just ridiculous. I mean, everyone knew it was ridiculous. I think the union probably knew it was ridiculous. They were saying things like private car service for the actors back and forth. I mean, like, it, like no. things that didn't make any sense, you know, and there was no actor right. that was like, yes, thank God, private car service. Everyone was like, are you crazy? We'll close and in a week. If you, and if you got COVID, you would be put in a hotel uh, to, to question yourself. It's, <laughs> it's unbelievable. And, you know, and I think they, I think that I don't, I, you know, again, I'm not on the inside of the union, definitely not their press rep, but I would say that probably they had to release something. Maybe, you know, it was, it was they were feeling pressure to release some kind of guideline. So they yeah. put this out and everyone just laughed. Everyone was like, you've got to be kidding me. But it, it really was, there was nothing else that I don't think they could do. I don't think they could say anything else. I mean, they should have just said, we plead the fifth until we're ready to release the actual <laughs> guidelines. Um, uh, my partner's- I'll share, I'll share a story with you. Um, Sandra Lee, who is the original Mini Faye, in Hello Dolly. When they were doing the original Hello Dolly, she shared a dressing room with Eileen Brennan. And they got into a huge fight. This was at the St. James Theater. And so they both said because of their status in the show, they both were entitled 
essentially to their own dressing room. So they went to the producer, David Merrick, and they built a plat uh, they built a wall uh, separating the two dressing rooms. And as Sandra told me, one part of the dressing room had the radiator and the other side had the air conditioner. So one <laughs> suffered in the winter, <laughs> one suffered in the summer. And that wall stood up until uh, the producers came there and Gary Beach said, this dressing room is so small, take the wall down, not realizing that it was built to be a larger dressing room in the first place. <laughs> so, and, you know, but that brings up an interesting uh, point. I bring this story up for this reason. We also don't know, there's so much that we still don't know about the changes in temperature mm -hmm. and the seasons. And it's, you know, it's one thing, I don't know about both of you, but I pretty much have self-quarantined for the past year. And I didn't have a cold. I didn't have any of those things that I normally have. In addition to dealing with COVID, you know, when flu season comes around and all of those things, we've got those concerns as well. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, they, they said the um, incidence of flu is way down this past year because because people stay at home and because when they were outside, they were masked, right? You know, and that just wearing the mask is going to help prevent you from getting the flu. <laughs> so, Well, Kevin, I, I want to ask you also, there was a time when a lot of headliners would be brought onto the cruise ships. And then in recent years, they went for the big opulent Broadway style or Las Vegas style reviews. Do you think that we will get back to seeing the more intimate shows, do you think it would be a better fit for a lot of the headliners that started losing out on work because of the changes in the industry? Do you think we're going to swing back? I, I mean, you know, Norwegian has made a, an interesting step in starting to get union contracts in their shows, like so Brenda Braxton is appearing in... Um, uh, uh, oh, I can't remember the name of the show. It was, uh, it was Warren Carlyle's show. Uh, after midnight. So, mm -hmm. you know, Brenda Braxton is the kind of headliner. The, the issue, the issue with the headliner is that every ship and every cruise line has a unique identity to it now, where the, I think, you know, what, what we all remember as the headliner era was cruising was opulent and there was a, we dressed up and we went to dinner and there was kind of a, an event about it. It's now, um, it's now kind of a forget your worries, forget, come on, get happy kind of feel on most cruise lines. Mm -hmm. But interestingly, Richard, I think a lot, there's there's this whole burgeoning part of the cruise industry that people who don't have a lot of money, like me, I don't know about you both, but I don't have a ton of money, but I, I only know it because of the inside uh, insider version, but these, these small um, curated ships, the Regent ships, the Silver Windstar, Sea ships, Windstar. the Oceania ships, exactly. So those are the ships that I think, and, and even even the, uh, even Virgin, even Virgin, the, the two new Virgin ships or the three new Virgin ships have a very uh, opulent sense about them. They're a little bit crazier because it's adults mm -hmm. only. Um, and I think all of the cruise directors are maybe uh, probably, dra I think drag performers. I mean, it's a very fantastic ship, you know? I mean, they're, they're, th those are the ships and the, the curated ships, I think, could bring back that header idea. And I know in, in, in a few ways they sort of do. The Regent Lines and the Oceania Lines, which I've worked with both of them, they have these enrichment series. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's it's all about, you know, the, pa the passenger on that ship, the client on that ship, or the consumer is very much interested in furthering their, their, their experience when they're on the ship, as opposed to kind of, you know, the, the, the carnival, princess, some of the Norwegian class ships, where the consumer is more about shutting the outside world out and kind of enjoying um, things that they don't have, the kind of, uh, you know, the extravagance of the buffet, mm -hmm. being able to, to, to play a laser tag on the, you know, those kind of all in one things that people love. Um, right. I think, but I, I hope, I do hope that that, that headliner does come back because it's such a it's such a fantastic period and it, it makes so much sense for those larger the more exclusive ships. Mm -hmm. 
Well, you know, I've only performed on one cruise ship, and that was the Windstar. It was a crew of 80 with 150 passengers. Wow. So it was, was five-star all oh. the way. And going through the Greek islands, it was one of the most incredible experiences of my life. Uh, and, uh, and that spoiled me completely from wanting to go on the bigger cruise ships, even before COVID. I said, this is what I want. Um, you know, getting, and when you are performing as a headliner on a, a small ship like that, uh, and you're with the same people, uh, every night I was eating at a different table and getting to know the people there. And it was just great, great experience. Uh, but I wanna go so that we come full circle. Uh, we are now coming out of COVID, hopefully, uh, and getting back. Has your schedule started to pick up again? 100%, absolutely. There's, there's uh, Hallmark is, is, is back in development. I mean, you know, for most of last year, they weren't technically in development, even though things were getting developed. They weren't, they weren't you know, no one was full steam ahead. Mm -hmm. um, so that has been, uh, it's over, almost been overwhelming in a way because, you know, shot out of a cannon right back into the world and saying, great, can you do this? And you kind of think, can I? I'm not sure my brain still works that fast. <laughs> you know, you, it, it seems like years ago that I was, uh, that I was actually doing five things at once. But um, yeah, it's, it, it, everything's picking up again. Cruise Line is starting to uh, really come back. Um, I have a really interesting project that's going to be coming up in Times Square. Um, I, I don't fancy myself an event producer, but this uh, kind of falls under the theatrical event. The costume industry, I think I'm, you're probably getting a, 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 an exclusive here because we haven't actually announced it to the press yet. So I'll, I'll say it sort of sim okay. simply here so it doesn't get clipped okay. by the press release. But the costume industry has really been looked over almost by all the grants and you know there's the occasional sba grant or the the ppp which has helped out but you know they, they're an industry that that um as as a friend of mine likes to say you know broadway keeps saying we'll, we're, we'll be back september and and he's and he says no one's called us <laughs> you know and and costume shops are the ones that are going to preempt the whole thing so what mm -hmm. we've done is um under under the guidance of of um, Brian Blythe at the Costume Industry Coalition. We've kind of found this idea, this idea of having this uh, edutainment kind of uh, immersive exhibition of costumes Those and kind so, of this, wow. this. It's gonna be, it's gonna be stunning. I can't tell you anyone who's who's in there, but I can tell you it's going to be on two levels in Times Square, over a hundred and fifteen costumes at this point from. TV, film, opera, ballet, theater, cruise line. I mean, it's, it's, I, I try not to, to detail the facts too much because I, again, I start, the flop sweat starts again, but it's going to be beautiful. It's going to open up in July. Uh, and we're dealing with those protocols, those COVID protocols too. But they're, it's getting a little simpler. We want to make consumers feel safe, but it is getting a little simpler when you can say, you know, temperature techs, masks inside. We know those two things work and, you know, people can have a good time. Terrific. And are you going to be doing this with real artists or are you using mannequins to display these costumes? Uh, are you able to talk? I know that you, we have to be guarded with how much information you can give out. Uh, but what is the basic premise of how this will unfold? So it's going to be, um, it's basically the idea of page to stage. So it's, it's come see these amazing costumes, but also maybe along the way, learn a little bit about the artisans behind it. So what will be mannequins, um, actually just sent an email before I hopped on with you guys saying, can, how much for 115 mannequins? <laughs> so so the, the process continues, um, but uh, it'll open in late July. It's gonna be um, a timed entry. Um, it's about a 45 minute to an hour experience. There'll be uh, narrative points along the way that detail some of the, without getting, too granular about it. We don't want to get too deep because we want to still we want people to still, you know, appreciate the overall aspect of everything. But there'll be live people from the shops there beating. There'll be people there uh, showing process. We're going to be partnering with um, a digital platform to do um, some um, uh, some uh, featured lecture series with these with these designers. Um, so Paul Taswell from, from Hamilton will, will speak on how he made, you know, how he designs that. And it's just, it's going to be, it's a, it's a beautiful event. It will run for, 
as of right now, we think about 10 weeks. So mm -hmm. um, stay tuned for more information on that. It's in it's the heart of Times Square. Square. Yes. And, and it's gonna and Times Square coming, coming back. back. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes. You know, it's always amazed me that in New York City that we don't have a theater museum, uh, that we don't have a museum that celebrates the history. What was that? It's coming. It's it coming. coming. Really? It's coming. Yeah. Do, do you know about it? I don't. Well, I, obviously, I don't know about it. <laughs> Kevin, you and I have to talk. Yeah. <laughs> No, so, this is something we've been writing we're about. Speaking, we're about speaking the right things. When's yeah. it coming? <laughs> All right, give us the inside scoop here. I, I, I believe. I again, maybe I'm speaking out of school, but who cares? I'm not under. I'm not under any kind of NDA. I, I believe the Mu Museum of Broadway is coming to to Times Square. I believe it's a. It's already been greenlit. It's part of the. You know, I, I have to give huge props to the Times Square Alliance. They, yes. in, the, in the worst of times, they keep it together. And in the best of times, they keep it getting even better. They really are, they're really an incredible organization. They've even, if you, if you get a chance, if anyone gets a chance to go to Times Square, they've even enacted so smartly um, in all of the storefront windows that have closed, they've enacted these art, these uh, paintings, these murals in the windows mm -hmm. so they can feature artists. It also helps to not look into a vacant storefront, which is so smart, okay. you know, from a business standpoint. Okay. So I, I, Times Square Alliance is really huge. Yeah, the Museum of Broadway, I think it, it I'm almost positive. Yeah, maybe I shouldn't be saying yeah, that. This is great news because it, it's something, yeah. you know, I discovered that, you know, we don't have a Broadway Walk of Fame such as the Hollywood Walk of Fame or the Palm Springs Walk of Fame. And I've been told that the reasoning behind that is first of all, both of those are run by the Chamber of Commerce of each respective city. And New York City does not have a Chamber of Commerce. I don't know if you know that or not, but it doesn't. Oh, and the other thing that. is that uh, New York City is a city that's constantly changing. And because things are being dug up, things are being put, you know, that they're just concerned of the upkeep. There's no one to take care of it, uh, essentially. But uh, with all the work that's been happening in Times Square, I'm thrilled to hear this. This is really good news. And an exclusive today for Judy and myself. Right. <laughs> so what's exclusive. next for you? So what's next for you? Well, um, I, so so I, this big, you know, I'm this big hallmark project for me is looming. I'm hoping it, that 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 comes through. And the minute that does, that's going to take a lot of a lot of work. But you know, I mean, the the networking still continues. I network with. I, I'm not I'm not a, ho a Hollywood film producer. So so if I come up with ideas for projects that maybe aren't necessarily a fit for Hallmark. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm interested in meeting the people that, that can make those happen as well. So I'm constantly still cold calling, uh, some studios and, and getting some good success. So, uh, that's, that's really my next thing is to really kind of expand my, my, um, my, my, my network in the, in the film industry. Cause I really enjoy it. Uh, Hallmark ha tells stories like, like we do in theater, you know, they're very, they're act structured, they're character based. And I was really romanced by by not just the 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 way the the types of movies they produce, but the way they produce, and so it's it's been a great education for me. Well, I want to ask you, in addition to your pursuit of uh, projects, um, are you inundated with people reaching out to you saying, "I've got an idea for you"? Does that happen a lot? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't know if I'm, I wouldn't say I'm inundated because I, you know, but I did just, I did just launch a new website and I did have the web designer put up, please don't send scripts or pitches or, you know, because the truth is, is it's not just um, disinterest. Uh, it's not disinterest. It's, it's actually legally. I, I, I really, I don't read anything uh, because I don't want someone to, to, to think, Oh well, I sent that to him, and he read it, and now there's this movie. Then I can say, well, you know, so so le so legally, I was kind of you know really boxed in to say I don't really read anything. That said, a couple of great people that I that I have always been fans of in the Broadway community who aren't in my network have emailed me and said, hey, I've got a, a pitch here, a pitch there, and and I always say, oh my gosh, my my high school heart is beating. Not for all of them, there you know, but but a lot, mm -hmm. a, a many of them. Um, uh, the the fact that someone reached out to to me, little old. 
you know, playbill, playbill clutching Kevin Duda right outside the stage door from Western Massachusetts. <laughs> well, Kevin, I it's can't fun. believe this, but we are at the end of our program. Uh, but don't oh. go anywhere right now. I want to say a few things to everyone. First of all, uh, Judy and I, Dr. Bloom and I, uh, are taking off the summer, as I said at the beginning of the show, for those of you who came in later. Um, but we are going to be back in uh, after Labor Day, uh, looking at where we're going forward instead of hopefully looking back over what we've gone through over the past year. Um, I can speak, I think, for Dr. Bloom when I say this. Uh, we are grateful. We are grateful that you all have taken the time to be with us. I want to thank all the guests that we've had on the show during COVID, talking about, such as you, Kevin, talking about your experiences, how it's affected you, and what you're bringing to the table as far as COVID is concerned, and how we move forward, keeping our creativity going. Um, I want to thank everyone for being here. If it's your first time watching this show, please subscribe to Richard Skipper Celebrates on YouTube. Leave a comment, leave a comment, uh, leave a comment. Uh, you too, Kevin. Uh, hit the like button. Let people know what your thoughts are on the show. We do this not for ourselves. We do this for you. Um, I also end all of my shows by telling you we want to go out and do something nice for somebody else without expecting anything in return. Go to your Facebook friends list, and the second or third name that pops up, reach out with a phone call. Not an email message, not a text message, not a private message, but a phone call. And let them know what they mean to you. As a dear friend of mine says, we're all in this together, but we're not in the same boat. But if you're going to be in a boat, make sure that you bring a skipper along. Think about that. So, Kevin, I, I'm going to give you the floor right now. Anything that you want to talk about that we've talked about today that you want to expound upon, anything that we didn't talk about that you wish we had, or just any message that you want to put out to everyone who's watching now. And thank you for all that you do, by the way. Oh my gosh, thank you both for having me. This has been, this has been very, it's been very freeing to just talk. I mean, I mean, been, I think we've all been on Zooms and, you know, you mentioned something that, that is very, been on my mind lately, which is <clears throat> that, that I keep telling myself social media is not where the conversations happen. And that's one thing I have to remind myself because I can I can read I can read a comment or I can read a, a thought or I can think, oh no, that's you know, there's no way I, I think I, I just I'm I'm eager to get back to conversations. I'm eager to to get back to whether they're the throwaway conversations of brunch over over a great bloody Mary dirty with some of that all in, you know, or, <laughs> or you know, uh, or, um, uh, uh, or, or it's just, you know, or it's the actual business conversations over coffee. I mean, I just really miss the kind of bopping around and having that energy for me is, is what I really missed about this last year. But I will say that of all the Zooms I've had, this has been the most successful conversation. I just did just, you guys have been open, open the floor and and, uh, and open hearts. It's just, it's great to, to speak to both of you. Thank you so much. And Dr. Bloom, Judy, I'm gonna give you the final word today. You know, and Kevin, I agree that casual camaraderie that you're talking about, you know, where it, it's not really planned, it just kind of happens. And, you know, you go out and you sit down at a bar and you happen to talk to the person next to you or you go, exactly, you know, somebody calls up and says, hey, I'm having brunch, meet me, you know, right? All that stuff. I'm, it's uh, it's so lovely to have it starting to come back in our lives again. It's it's so so missed that you know, and uh, there are a lot of people who are struggling with this. They're <clears throat> you know they have social anxiety disorder, and especially those people who have been you know truly locked up in a cave all this time and are now having to come back out again, and it's very difficult for them. Um, a lot of anxiety around that. Uh, so, you know, for, for everyone out there, it's time to just shake off the blues and jazz up your life, <laughs> you know? Thank you. Uh, and, and buy and tickets to a live event, please. Yeah. yeah. Buy tickets. Exactly. Thank you. I love you. Have a wonderful time and congratulations. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Good night, everyone. Good night.